Hi, today we're going to be learning about squares and square roots. So let's start off by looking at what squares are. When we talk about squares in maths, uh, when we're looking at numbers, not shapes, then what we're talking about is a number that is being multiplied by itself and it forms a square. So for example, you can have four times four, which if we were to draw this as a square like this, you can see that there are four blocks down the side and there are also four blocks along the top. Okay, so it is forming a square, a four by four square. Okay, and that is why this is called square because it forms a square like this. Okay, so this can be written, four times four can be written as Four to the power of two. That's how we say it. It's written with a big four like normal and then we have a little two written as a superscript or a little a little number up at the top over there. So that's a power or an exponent over there. Four is the base and our exponent is the two in this case. And the two tells us how many fours are being multiplied together. So in this case, there are two fours that are being multiplied together. So you can see over here, I've got two fours that are being multiplied together. So your exponent can be other numbers as well, but when we're working with squares, it's always going to be two because we are going to have uh, two being multiplied together that forms a square like this. Okay. So in this case, if you were to count all of these, or if you just multiply four by four, you would find that this is equal to 16. So four squared is also equal to 16. Okay, so we can say that 4 squared is 16, or we can also say that 4 times 4 is equal to 16. They mean the same thing, but in this way over here, I've written it in exponential form, where I've written it with this exponent, which is the 2 over there. Okay, so now what you're going to do is you are going to go and find out all the square numbers for each of these numbers inside our table over here. So remember, when you are finding the square numbers, you're going to take the base in each one and multiply it by itself. So in this case, I have 1 times 1, then 2 times 2, then 3 times 3. We've already done the 4 times 4, and that is 16. We already know that. Okay, so we know that 4 squared is 16. So that's what you're going to do now. I'm going to give you uh, 2 minutes to fill in this table. Okay, you should hopefully be done with those. So let's go through each of those. So you should have found that 1 squared is just 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, we already did 4 squared, it was 16, 
5 squared is 25, 6 squared is 36, 7 squared is 49, 8 squared is 64, 9 squared is 81, 10 squared is 100, 11 squared is 121, 12 squared is 144, 13 squared is 169, 15 squared is 225, 20 squared is 400, and 25 squared is 625. Then, when you're doing the second table over here, remember that you are now multiplying negative 1 by itself. So, effectively, you have two negatives that are being multiplied together. And remember, when we have an even number of negatives that are being multiplied together, we get a positive answer. So, all of these, when we square them, they will all be positive, okay? And if you look at them, the absolute values that we're working with are exactly the same as what they were in the first table. So in other words, all of our square numbers here are going to be identical to what they were in the first table because the only difference was the negative. And when I square a negative or when I multiply a negative by another negative, I get a positive answer. So my answers are all going to be exactly the same as they were in my first table. Okay, so that is what you should get when you square your negative numbers as well. Now, these square numbers are very useful numbers to know, okay? It's, and it is kind of important that you do actually know these. So I would recommend you go and learn these square numbers. If you know the positive ones, then you automatically know the negative ones as well because we know that when we square a negative number, because it means we're multiplying a negative by a negative, we end up with a positive answer. So these will all be the same as that. So you don't really have to learn these ones because you will know them by default when you learn these ones. Okay, now let's go and have a look at an example when we are squaring a decimal fraction. Okay, so in this example, we have got negative 0 0.4 And we're squaring it. Now remember that when we square a number, what we're doing is we're multiplying it by itself. So first of all, this is actually the same as 0 0.4 times, or negative 0 0.4, sorry, times negative 0 0.4. Now that means automatically that we've got a negative times a negative is a positive. Anytime you square a negative, you'll always get a positive answer. Always, always, always. Okay, but now the 0 0.4 times 0 0.4, you need to know how to deal with this, okay? When you are multiplying decimals together, what happens is we end up by taking the number of decimal points or places that we have in our question, in, the, in this state where we're still multiplying together, and our answer should have the sum of those. So if over here I've got one decimal place there and one decimal place there, then my answer should have 1 plus 1 is 2 decimal places, okay? And then we just multiply our numbers together like normal. So I've got 4 times 4. 4 times 4 is 16. So I'm going to have 16 in my answer. And I need to have two decimal places. And so I work from the end of that and make sure that I have two decimal places. So that's 1, 2. So my comma is going to go in front of the 1. And I'm going to have to have a, a, a 0 in front of that as well. So my answer for this one is positive because it is a negative that's being multiplied by another negative. Okay, and then I've got 4 times 4 is 16, but because it's a decimal, I need to make sure I have the right number of decimal places. So if I've got one decimal place being multiplied by one decimal place, I should end up with two decimal places. I add the number of decimal places. And then I make sure in my answer that working from the end of the 16 backwards, I have that right number of decimal places. So in this case, I'll go 1, 2, and my comma is going to go over there, and I've got 0, 0,16. Now this over here, I could have gone straight to that answer, like this. Okay, so first of all, I know it's going to be positive. Okay, so that's not going to be an issue. Then I square the 4, and that gives me 16. So I know I have to have 16. Now when I'm squaring a number, remember that we're multiplying the same number by itself. So if I'm multiplying 0 0.4 by 0 0.4, I'm going to have double the number of decimal places that I see over here. So if I see one decimal place here, then when I multiply it by itself, 
I'm multiplying by something else that has the same amount of decimal places, which is also one. So it's going to, my answer must have double this number of decimal places. So if I've got one decimal place here, my answer must have two decimal places. So I can go straight to saying, I know that it's 16 and I go one, two, there's my two decimal places. My comma goes there and my zero goes there. And I know it's positive because when I square a negative number, I'll always get a positive answer. Okay, so I can skip out this step entirely if I use what I know about square numbers. So if I know that four squared is 16, then I can straight away get that 16. If I know that when I square a negative number, I'll get a positive answer, I can straight away know that that's going to be positive. And if I know my rules for multiplying decimals, then I know that if I'm multiplying something with one decimal, place with something else that also has one decimal place or with itself which also has one decimal place so in this case we're multiplying it by itself then we need to have in our answer two decimal places so so long as i know those rules i can go and do my my um questions so let's just quickly write down what we did okay so first of all our sign when we are squaring it'll always be positive Okay, then in terms of our, the square number, I'm saying over here, square the non-zero part of the number. In other words, I'm not squaring the zero over here. I'm just squaring the four. Now that would, uh, you need to be careful if you've got something like a four and then a zero and then a one, then you need to worry about that zero. But if it's a zero that's in front or a zero that's after all of the non-zero numbers, you don't have to worry about those zeros. Okay. So for our, our number part, we square it. And then for our decimal places, we are going to, because we're squaring and that means that we're doubling the number of, or that means that we're multiplying it by itself. So we're multiplying by something else that has the same number of decimal places. And then when we, when we add the decimal places together, it's the same as just doubling the number of decimal places that we have here to start with. So for our decimal places, we double the number of decimal places. So in this case, there was one. So now there's one, two, we double it. Okay, so that's what we do when we are squaring our decimals. So now let's, I'm going to give you three that you're going to do by yourself. And I'm going to give you two minutes to work on this.
Okay, so let's go through those examples. So for question A, you had 0 0.3 squared. Okay, so first of all, we're going to see, well, our sign is going to be positive because it's always positive when we're squaring, but also this was starting off as positive, so it'd have to be positive anyway. So it's going to be positive. Then we're going to take the non-zero part of this, which is the 3, and we're going to square that. So 3 squared is 9. Now I need to make sure that I have the right number of decimal places. So I need to look over here. I have got one decimal place over here. And because I'm squaring, it means I'm multiplying it by itself. So when I multiply it by itself, I'm multiplying by something else that also has one decimal place. So altogether, I have two decimal places that I'm going to be, um, that I'm going to have in my answer. So I need to make sure that my answer has two decimal places. So now my comma is going to start off over here and I go one, two. So here's my comma, but that means I need to fill this spot in with something. So I'm going to put in a zero over there. And here's my comma, and then I have to put in a zero over there as well. So you should have got 0 0.09 for question A. Then question B, we had negative 0 0.07 squared. No extra bracket there. Okay, negative 0 0.07 squared. First of all, our sign is going to be positive. Okay, then we are multiplying or we're squaring the 7, so it's going to be 49. But now before I write it down, I'm just going to check how many decimal places I have. So I've got one, two decimal places. So when I multiply it by itself, I'm multiplying by something else that also has two decimal places. So all together, I will have four decimal places that I'm going to be multiplying together. So I need to make sure that my answer is going to have four decimal places. So I need to make sure I have kind of enough space to write that in. So I'm going to put my, four, my 49 a little bit further along. My decimal starts over here, and I'm going to check that I have four decimal places going this way. So one, two, three, four. So this is where my comma needs to go. I need to fill in all those extra places, places with zero. So I've got a zero there, zero there, and zero there. So I've got zero comma zero zero four nine. So that's what you should have got for question B. Obviously, without showing all of those little lines and things. Question C, we have got zero comma one two squared okay so in this case it's already positive so i don't need to worry about the sign and then we're going to be squaring 12 which gives us 144 and again just like in the previous one i've got one two decimal places so i need to have four decimal places in my answer so 144 and i need to make sure i have four decimal places now this is already three right so that means i need to have one extra place before or after my comma so i'm going to fill that extra spot with a zero and then put my comma and zero so you can do it like that as well without actually doing the little lines like this over here you can just say well i know that i need to have four i've only got two so i need to fill in two extra zeros and then put my comma and then my zero before that okay so that's what you should have got for question c okay now we're going to go on to squaring common fractions. So in this case, we have got two thirds squared. Okay, so now we know what to do when we're squaring decimal fractions. With common fractions, we need to make sure when we square it that we square everything in that fraction, okay? But it has to be in the form of a common fraction. It can't be a mixed fraction, okay? So I, or it can't have a number in front like that, or it can't have pluses and minuses. I have to make sure that I just have one fraction in there and then I can square. But I have to square the top and the bottom, the numerator and the denominator of my fraction. So in this case, when I square the numerator, which is the two, I get four. And when I square the denominator, which is three, I get nine. So when you're squaring fractions like this, normal fractions, not decimal fractions, normal fractions, we square the numerator and the denominator separately. Okay, but remember, it has to be in this form. So if you get it as a mixed number, you're going to have to first change it into a fraction like this that's not a mixed number, a normal common fraction, so that it would then be an improper fraction, and then you can square it. Okay, so you can't square it if it's still a mixed number. Okay, so now I'm going to give you three to work on by yourself. Okay, so for this, I'm also going to give you two minutes to work on it.
Okay, you should hopefully be done with that by now. So let's go through those examples. So for question A, you had negative 5 over 8 squared. So first of all, anytime we square something, it's always going to be positive because whether it's a positive that we're squaring, which will obviously be positive, or a negative which we're squaring, then we have a negative multiplied by a negative, which gives us a positive answer. So it'll always be positive. And then I have to square the top, which is 5 squared is 25 over, and we square the bottom, 8 squared is 64. So you should have got 25 over 64 for question A. Then question B, we have 4 over 7 squared. Okay, so first of all, I, I, in this case I don't have to worry even about a negative, so I just go straight on to the 4 and I square that and it gives me 16 over 7 squared is 49. Now you see why I said it's important for you to know those square numbers. At the moment you can be referring to your table, but it helps if you just know those square numbers off by heart. Okay, so question C, we have negative 1 and 1 ninth. Now remember I said when you have a mixed number, the first thing you're going to have to do is change that to an improper fraction. So we're going to change that to negative, we multiply the 1 by 9 and we get 9 and we add that and it gives me 10. So negative 10 over 9 squared and then we're going to go and square it and I get a positive answer and I square the 10 that gives me 100 over square the 9 and that gives me 81. Now you can change it back to a mixed number if you want to but you don't have to you can leave it as an improper fraction so long as it is as simple as it can go so if we can simplify it we would simplify it but in this case you can't okay so Question C is now done. Now we're going to go on to a couple of examples without fractions, but we're going to be looking at some where we are going to compare and see what happens when we um, square things separately and when we square them together. Okay, so first of all, we have got 2 plus 3 squared. And then we've got 2 squared plus 3 squared. And we're going to be comparing those two. And then we're going to look at 2 times 3 squared and 2 squared times 3 squared. We're going to be comparing those as well. Okay, so first of all, 2 plus 3 squared. If I simplify 2 plus 3 and I get 5, then that gives me 25. Okay, let's just... Okay, so... 2 plus 3 squared, I square it and I get 5, or I simplify it and I get 5 squared, and that gives me 25. This one over here, if I square the 2 and the 3 separately, I get 2 squared is 4, plus 3 squared is 9, and that gives me 13. So now you can see that if I have 2 plus 3 in brackets, and I simplify the 2 plus 3 and I square it and I get 25, it's not going to give me the same answer as if I square the 2 and the 3 separately. If I try squaring the 2 and 3 separately, I'm going to get different on a different answer completely. So I can't say that those are equal to each other. So 2 plus 3 in brackets squared is not the same as 2 squared plus 3 squared. So what does this tell us? This tells us that, remember, bed mass says we have to simplify whatever is inside the brackets first. So in this case, the 2 plus 3 is inside the brackets. I have to simplify that first before I can go on to the next step, which is e exponents, which we haven't dealt with yet until now. This is our exponent over here. We have to do what's inside the brackets before we can do our exponent. Okay, so that is addition. But let's have a look at what happens when we have multiplication. So with multiplication, if I simplify what's inside the brackets, I have 2 times 3, that is 6 squared, and that gives me 36. And then if I have 2 squared times 3 squared, that's going to be 4 times 9, which is also 36. Ah, so now I can say then that 2 times 3 squared is the same as 2 squared times 3. 3 squared. Now this is going to be something that's going to be very useful for us a little bit later on. So when you have addition or subtraction inside your brackets, you have got to simplify it first before you apply your exponent. But if you've got multiplication or division, like we were doing with our fractions, and just remember fraction is division, okay, when you've got multiplication or division, then you can apply the exponent to the things separately and it will still give you the same answer. 
Okay, so that is very useful to know, particularly later on. But when you've got addition and subtraction, it is super, super, super important. You've got to do the, the addition and subtraction inside the brackets first. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a couple of examples or three examples that you're going to work on for yourself. Again, I'm giving you three minutes or two minutes to work on this rather. Okay, you should hopefully be done with those, so let's go through each of those. So for question A, you had 7 minus 3 in brackets squared. So remember, it's very important we have got to simplify our subtraction that's inside the brackets first. So I've got 7 minus 3, that gives me 4 squared, and that gives me an answer of 16. Over here, I had 6 plus 2 in brackets squared. So again, I have to simplify the 6 plus 2, which is in brackets first. That gives me 8. Now, I didn't have to write the brackets again here because I had nothing else. So here I can just write 8 squared, and that gives me 64. Over here, I've got 1 minus 8 is negative 7. Now here, I do have to write those brackets. Those brackets actually are very important over here because I have to square the whole of the negative 7. Okay, so I can't just be squaring the 7. I have to be squaring the negative as well because it's part of what was inside there. So it's negative 7 squared, and that gives me positive 49, because remember when we square a negative number, we get a positive answer. So for question A, you should have got 16, for question B, 64, and for question C, 49. Okay, so that is squares that we have dealt with now. Now we're going to go on and look at square roots. Okay, now square roots use the symbol like this. So for a square root, you'll have this symbol and then you'll have whatever number you're square rooting inside it. So you can have something like this, 16, inside that square root sign. Okay, so now this, what we need to know for this is that the square root takes you back to what gave you the square in the first place. So what was squared in the first place. So if you have the number 16, we want to know what was squared to get 16. Okay, so that is the square root, is what was squared to get 16. So we're doing the square backwards. Okay, so in this case, the number that was squared to get 16 was 4. So the square root of 16 is 4. Okay, so what you're going to do over here is you are going to uh, fill in this table. In this case, I have given you, uh, just hang on. Oh, 
Okay, so I'm just going to change that time quickly. Okay, so in this case, I have given you the numbers that are being square rooted, and you need to find what those square roots are for each number. Okay, so we've already done this one over here. The square root of 16 is 4. Okay, so in other words, we square 4 to get 16, so the square root of 16 must be 4. So that's what you're going to do now. You're going to fill in the rest of the missing numbers in this table by finding out what the square roots of each of these numbers are. Okay, so I'm going to give you two minutes to work on that. Okay, you should be done with that by now. So let's go through each of those examples or each of those square roots. So the square root of one is one. The square root of four is two because we square two to get four. The square root of nine is three because we square three to get nine. We've done the square root of 16. The square root of 25 is five because five squared is 25. The square root of 36 is six because 36 or six squared is 36. The square root of 49 is 7, because 7 squared is 49. The square root of 64 is 8. The square root of 81 is 9. The square root of 100 is 10. The square root of 121 is 11. The square root of 144 is 12. The square root of 169 is 13. The square root of 225 is 15. The square root of 400 is, two, is 20, and finally the square root of 625 is 25. Okay, so now if you know your square numbers, then you should really know what your square roots are as well. So it is useful to know these square roots, but if you know those square numbers, then you should automatically know the square roots as well, because they go together. Okay, now we're going to go on to an example again with a decimal. Okay, so let's go and look at that. So in this one, we've got 0, 0,36, which we are square rooting. So we need to know what is the square root of the decimal fraction 0, 0,36. So first of all, I'm never going to have the square root of a negative number because remember, when we square a number, we always get a positive answer. Okay, so I can't have a negative inside here. And if I do, I'm going to teach you what happens with that later on. Okay, but first, in this case, so I'm, I shouldn't really have to worry about a negative. Uh, then, if you've got, in this case, a decimal, then you need to look at how many decimal places, just like we did before. So I've got two decimal places, and I'm going to teach you what to do with that. And then also, you're going to be square rooting the number part of it. So in this case, it's the 36. So the square root of 36 is 6. 
Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is square root or actually check that it is positive. And like I said, if it isn't positive, I'm going to teach you what happens about that still, but it should be positive, and uh, so you just need to check that it is positive. The next thing you're going to do is you are going to square root the number part, or the non-zero part of the number. So in this case, we are square rooting the 36. And when we square root 36, that gives us 6, because 6 squared is 36. So I know that I'm going to get 6 from the 36 over there. But then that isn't my whole answer, because 6 squared would be 36, so the square root of 36 is 6. So the square root of 0, 36 can't also be 6, because they're not the same. Okay. So now I have to make sure that I have the right decimal over here. So now I check for my decimal places. Okay, now when we were squaring, we doubled the number of decimal places because when you square, remember, you are multiplying whatever you've got that you're squaring by itself. So if you have one decimal place, then when you square it, you're going to end up with two decimal places. If you have two decimal places, when you square it, you're going to end up with four because you have two decimal places times two decimal places. If you have three, then you're going to end up with six because you have three decimal places times three decimal places. And we always add the total number of decimal places together to get our final answer, or the decimal places in our final answer, rather. So over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going backwards. So I'm going to say, well, if I have, at the moment, 0, 0,36, it has two decimal places. So how many decimal places did each thing have to have to start with? Well, I have to divide it by 2 because I'm taking the square root, which means that I had two things that are being multiplied together to give me that 0, 0,36. And they had to be the same as each other. So one of the decimal places had to come from the one, and the other decimal place had to come from the other one. Okay, so I'm going to halve the number of decimal places. Okay, so that's what you need to do for the decimal places. So in this case, I have two decimal places over there, which means that I need to halve that. So if I've got two, I now need to have one decimal place. So I've only got one number, so that's how many decimal places I need to have. So I don't need to have any extra zeros. Um, I can just put my comma there, so that is my one decimal place, and then I put my zero that comes before my comma as well. So I've got zero comma six, and if we square zero comma six, we would get zero comma three six. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a couple to work on for yourself, or three to work on for yourself. Again, you have two minutes to work on this.
Okay, let's go through those examples. So question A, you had 0, 0,81. So first I check, is it positive? Yes, it is, so I don't have to worry about that. Okay, so now I'm going to go and I'm going to square root the non-zero part of it, so it's 81. I square root that and that gives me 9. Then I have to make sure that my decimal places are right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to count how many decimal places I have in 0, 0,81. I've got one two decimal places so my answer should have half of that so if there's two then my answer should have one decimal place now there is only one number here which means that it is going to be my only decimal place so i'm going to have my comma before that so it's zero comma nine so that is what you should have got for question a for question b again i check it's positive so i don't that's fine now i'm going to go and i'm going to square root the 64 which is my non-zero part of it which if I square root 64, that gives me 8, okay? But now, let me check how many decimal places I have. I have 1, 2, 3, 4 decimal places. So that means that if I halve that, I should have 2 decimal places in my answer. Now, this is only one number, one digit. So I need to have an extra digit for my decimal places. So I'm going to put in an extra 0 over here. So that's going to be my second decimal place. And then I also need to have my comma and my 0 before. Okay, so that's what you should have for question B, 0, 0,08. Then for question C, again, it's positive, so I don't have any problems there. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to square root my non-zero part, which is, if you look at it, if you just take out that comma, it looks like a number 121. That is what we are now square rooting, 121, okay? So if we square root 121, we get 11. Okay, so now let's have a look at our decimal places. I only have two decimal places in this one. So when I square root it, I should have half of that, which is only one. But now my answer has got two digits, which means that I need to put my comma in the right place so that I only have one decimal place. So this is going to be my one decimal place. So my comma has to go in between the two ones. So it's 1 comma 1, not 0 comma 1 1 and not 11. It is 1 comma 1. So for question C, that is what you should have got, 1 comma 1. Okay, question D, or not, not question, in the next example rather. Now we've got a common fraction again. So just like when we were doing squaring with fractions, it works the same when we're doing square roots. We also have to do the numerator and the denominator both. Okay, so for the square root of 49 over 64, I am going to find the square root of 49 first, and that's going to give me 7, over the square root of 64, which is 8. So when you are finding the square root of a common fraction, you have to find the square root of the numerator, which is the top, and the square root of the denominator, which is the bottom. Again, just like with squaring, if that was a mixed fraction, we would first have to change it into an improper fraction, and then we would apply our, our square root to the numerator and the denominator. We can't do it if we've got a number in front, because that messes things up, because then we actually have addition. Remember, we learned that with uh, squaring, and it works the same with square roots, when you've got addition, you have to simplify that first. And if I have a square, if I have a mixed number, that's actually the same as having a number plus a fraction. So that's addition. So I have to combine it into one thing. So then we have to change it into a mixed or an improper fraction from a mixed number into an improper fraction first. So in the examples you're going to be doing now, you're going to have one like that, where you're going to have a mixed number that you're going to be working with so make sure that you do that okay so i'm going to give you two minutes to work on these three questions as well
Okay, you should be done with those questions, so let's go through each of them. So for question A, you have the square root of 36 over 25. So first we square root the 36, and that gives us 6, and then we square root the 25, and that gives us 5. So that gives us 6 over 5. For question B, we have the square root of 100 over 121. So the square root of 100 is 10 over the square root of 121, which is 11. And then question C, we have the square root of 6 and 1 quarter. So now just like when we were doing our squaring, we first had to change that into a, an improper fraction. So 6 times 4 is 24, plus 1 is 25. So this is 25 over 4, and we still have to square root that. Okay, so the square root of 25 over 4 gives me 5 over 2. So that's what you should get if you are getting the square root of 25 over 4. Okay, now let's go. And just like when we were doing our squaring, we're going to compare what happens when we have got addition under your square root sign and multiplication under your square root sign if you do it separately or together. Okay, so first of all, we've got the square root of 9 plus 16, and then the square root of 9 plus the square root of 16. And we're going to compare those. Then we've got the square root of 9 times 16, and then the square root of 9 times the square root of 16. And we're going to compare those as well. Okay, so first, 9 plus 16, if I simplify that, I get 25. So the square root of 25, that gives me 5. Here, if I square root them separately, I get 3 plus 4, which is equal to 7. So these, I can say, are not equal to each other. So the square root of 9 plus 16 is not equal to the square root of 9 plus the square root of 16. Over here, I've got 9 times 16, which if we work that out, we get 144, so that is the square root of 144, and that gives us 12. Okay, now if I take the square root of 9, I get 3 times the square root of 16, which is 4, that also gives me 12. So now I can say, therefore, the square root of 9 times 16 is the same as the square root of 9 times the square root of 16. So just like with squares, if I've got additional subtraction inside, I have to simplify that first, okay? Because it's not the same as if I do it separately. So I can't square root the 9 and the 16 separately and expect to get the same answer as if I squared it after I added them. Whereas with multiplication and division, I can do it separately and I will get the same answer, which is why when we're doing our fractions, we can do the top and the bottom separately and, we'll, and that is correct, okay? For multiplication and division, we can apply the exponent uh, separately to the different parts, but only if there is no addition or subtraction inside that root sign. Just like with exponents, only if there's no addition or subtraction inside the brackets. Okay, so now I'm going to give you two minutes to work on three examples for yourself.
Okay, you should be done with that, so let's go through those questions. So for question A, you had the square root of 100 minus 36, and that, you first simplify the 100 minus 36, and that gives you 64. So the square root of 64 is equal to 8. So then question B, you had the square root of 25 plus 144, that simplifies to 169, and the square root of 169 is 13. And then the last one, question C, you had the square root of 625 minus 49, and that gives you 576. Now this is one that you wouldn't necessarily know, so you can use your calculator for this, okay? So the square root of 576 is 24. Okay, so that is what you should get for each of those different questions. Now in terms of the calculator, you can use the calculator for this work so long as you are showing all of your calculations. So like over here, I used the calculator to subtract 625 minus 49, and I still wrote down the 576, and then I used the calculator, sorry, I should have written square root, then I still used the calculator to simplify the square root of 576 and get 24. But I didn't just take the calculator and type in what I saw over there and write down the answer. You have to show the process that you're following, you have to show all of your working out, but you can use the calculator to help you with that working out, so long as you're showing what you're actually doing. Okay. Right, so that's question C, we should get 24. Now the last thing I need to do with you is, I told you already that I was going to tell you what happens when you have negative numbers. So when you do have the square root of a negative number. So now we've already looked at the fact that you can't possibly get a square which is negative because whether you are squaring a positive number like four or a negative number like negative four, Either way, you get a positive answer, because when you're squaring a positive number, it obviously will give you a positive answer. And when you're squaring a negative number, you have a negative multiplied by a negative, which also gives you a positive answer. So it doesn't matter if you start with a positive or a negative, when you square it, you'll always get a positive answer. So it's impossible for you to get a negative square number, which means that you can't find the square root of a negative number, because there's no number that you could square to get that number in the first place. So if you do happen to get a question like this, negative, the square root of negative 16, or something like this, where you've got a negative which you are square rooting, then this is what we call imaginary, or non-real. Doesn't matter which term you use, they both are correct, but this is what we call imaginary or non-real. It is not part of the real number system that we are used to dealing with. Um, so this is something that at this stage you won't be working with. You won't be working with imaginary numbers. If you continue with maths later on in university, then you're more likely to deal with those. But at this stage, you don't work with those at all. So they are imaginary or non-real. So if you do get a question like that, then you will just write imaginary or non-real. You won't try and work it out. Okay, so that is what we do with squares and square roots. Now that we've learned the concepts in this lesson, it's important to practice, practice, practice. If you haven't already got the worksheet that goes with this video, you can find it by clicking on the link in the description below. The worksheet comes with an extra exercise full of questions for you to work on to master the concepts covered in this lesson. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button so that others can benefit from it too. Also be sure to subscribe so that you can easily find my other lessons and hit the bell so that you will get notified about lessons as I upload them.